Um, so maybe I'll, I'll start out by talking a little bit about um, picking up on the theme from, from uh, yesterday when we were talking about policy. And uh, the reason I want to start there a little bit is just to frame sort of some of the ideas that we present here in the right context. You know, when we, when we kind of develop policy and we implement it, we, we start with this idea of vision, then we move to strategy, and then we move to tactics. And quite often when policy goes awry, it's because it skips one of those steps. It goes from a, a grand vision straight to let's do this. Um, you know, you, you can think of different things like uh, the uh, ethanol, corn to ethanol standard that was pursued in the US. It's like we want to have more renewable fuel in the gasoline mix. I know let's just convert corn to ethanol and you went straight to the or that jurisdiction went straight to the solution um, and you skip over the strategy part with that kind of as context um, what i'm presenting here is i think a tactical option it may not be the best tactical option but we want to put it on the table with all of the other ones and then as we go through the strategic process say you know which ones and how much do we want to employ so i just like to set that as context for what we're, we're talking about here. So just, just a bit of a grounding. Um, we've seen a lot of this information through these sessions already in various different forms, but this, uh, one of Emily's uh, analysts put this in front of me a few weeks ago and it was, it was, it was pretty um, illustrative to me of, of what we're talking about. So the chart on the, on the right that you see, that's the uh, total GHG emission profile for BC from 92 to about 2017 and as we talked about yesterday right around 64 65 uh, megatons per year uh, what was and and of that you can see the biggest chunk about 50 of the 65 is uh, from the energy industry industry the uh, production and consumption of primarily natural gas and the rest is the balance of industry in BC what was really um, what really stood out for us is the yellow targets and, and this one here in 2030 is a significant reduction and that's only 10 years away. So I think when we look at all these tools, you know, we really have to think carefully about what the opportunities are because it's, it's a pretty daunting challenge in front of us. But as I alluded to at the beginning, because the LNG supply chain is a little bit unique from conventional gas markets, uh, we have some different opportunities and some different constraints. So maybe just talking about this a little bit and uh, again, a little bit of context setting. Um, the CO2 that we're talking about in this context is fundamentally it's formation CO2. So it's what was in the gas reservoir that got produced along with the methane and ultimately put into the transmission system. And generally across North America, sales gas pipelines, the ones that go ultimately to the market that deliver gas to our homes for our furnaces or the power generation plants, you can generally accept about 2% CO2. There's a variety of constraints, but one of the key ones is that the consumers can accept 2% CO2 in the gas. Now that's CO2, so, so if we follow kind of the thread of what's happened, that CO2 is in the reservoir, it was produced along with the methane, it was put into the pipeline, transported to, let's say your furnace, and burned along with methane and then just emitted. So we're talking about trying to sequester carbon and the carbon molecule we're talking about here actually started in a reservoir as, carb as CO2 and went into the atmosphere. What's unique about this though is when we talk about the LNG supply chain and everything we're talking about here, the market, this incremental 60 million or 59 and a half million tons per year, I think that's eight BCF a day or something like that. Um, that's all for an LNG market and its requirements are a little bit different. An LNG plant actually has to remove essentially all of the CO2 before they can convert the methane into uh, LNG. Uh, and just to put that in, in constant units, we talk about 50 ppm is what the LNG plant can tolerate, that's 0.005%. So conventional gas pipeline can, can accept, conventional gas market can accept 2%, LNG can plant can accept 0.005%. The key point there is you now have to spend money on infrastructure to remove CO2 for an LNG plant that you don't have to do in a conventional gas market. So this, is, this has nothing to do about GHGs or anything like that. It's just simply there's an there's a expenditure and a facility that has to be built now in this new supply chain that you didn't have to build before. Conveniently, 
that infrastructure you have to build is the first part of the carbon capture process, at least when we're talking about these CO2 molecules. We were talking a little bit, uh, industry doesn't tend to conspire against things, but we, we do have a real bias to do things the way we've always done them, just because we know how to do them that way. And, and our default condition, I think, would be simply to build these transmission systems exactly like we build every other transmission system. So what we're kind of, what we actually want to bring to this group for consideration is maybe a different way to approach the transmission systems. Sorry to interrupt, but why, why is that uh, such a look so much of a lower requirement? It's because of the, you don't want to compress CO2. It's because CO2 um, will turn solid long before methane will turn liquid. And so what happens is you actually essentially have CO2 ice forming inner process, and that will block off the process, create a lot of problems. So that's, that's critical. Um, you know, and we'll actually come back to why we even started thinking about this, because it wasn't actually around CO2 at all. Uh, a couple things uh, to think about, and I'm gonna kind of work backwards on the slide. The chart on the bottom, this shows if those of you are familiar with our T-South pipeline, it starts around Chetwin and delivers down to Huntington Sumas uh, on the border of BC and Washington. Um, you can see the level of CO2 in, in there. Now it's actually pretty low today. Um, that's not a big carbon footprint on a couple BCF at half a, per, at a quarter percent. Remember the pipeline can accept up to 2%, but there's a couple things I want you to take away from this chart. The first is that it does change over time. And the place we're at right now, I would argue, is actually at a very low place in terms of what we can expect over the life of FNCI scenario one um, of what we'll see in the supply gas. And then on the table you see here now on the left, these are some of the different plays. You'll note the Montney here, and this is, I think, the OGC's numbers. The Montney is on average 1%, and we're seeing a quarter percent. And that's because the Montney isn't homogenous. Just as we prefer to drill the richer gas right now, we're also drawing, dr drilling the lower CO2 gas. So if we're really low right now, we can expect in the future we'll probably see it come up a little bit. Um, and then if you get into the other plays, of course, some of the others are higher. Um, uh, I wish we still had the, our geologists in the room. Uh, my personal feeling is there's so much gas in the Horn, in the Montney, I'm not sure we have to worry about the 10% gas in Horn River, but we list it there just as a illustration of variability. And then hopefully Rob will go into more detail because I'm certainly not an expert of this, but, but I think this illustrates the main point. Um, this shows you roughly where the sequestration opportunities are. And, and it was mentioned yesterday, I think it's quite correct. Our best sequestration opportunities tend to be in the producing basins where we actually got the uh, gas from originally. The edge of the producing basin is right here. It's kind of around Chetwin, um, if that's familiar. And as you move west of there, sequestration opportunities are, are very limited, if, if at all. There is one that had been identified um, on the west coast, was, that was mentioned yesterday. Our understanding is it's, and again, I'm not an expert, that it's not a great, um, a great uh, storage reservoir. Um, there are some excellent ones actually uh, that have operated in recent history uh, near Chetwin, um, as an example. I think the other thing is, uh, we'll talk about in a minute, if the place you wanna capture the CO2 that's in the pipeline is at the LNG facility, where well, you're now capturing it at possibly two to four different locations, depending on how many and where all those LNG facilities are built. And you'd have to now capture all of that CO2 and bring it back to a common point and just think about what it would take to build like now a pipeline from Prince Rupert, Prince Rupert and Kitimat up to Terrace just to consolidate CO2 and then find a place to sequester it. What I'm building up to is, is the better place to deal with this is, the f it is on the upstream side. And we think there's a really logical place to do that. And so, so here was kind of the point. Uh, this is, this is a, a, a magnified view of the new either proposed or existing pipelines that all go from the producing basin to the, to the northwest coast. Um, so including uh, PNG that's 
already there. And the gray area that you see in the top right corner is the edge of the sedimentary basin. And essentially, that's the edge of the Montney. So once you move west of there, you're rapidly moving away from reservoirs where you could store CO2. And so what we asked ourselves, we actually, the reason we started doing this was around electrification. And we were looking at the LNG facility and saying, what part of the LNG process could we actually move away from the coast and move it upstream where it would be easier to electrify? And that's actually where this whole conversation started. And, uh, and then we started talking about CO2 as we went on. And so this is, this is a bit of a question actually for the people who are building the facilities. When we look at this, we say, is it a free move? Because you already had to spend the money at the LNG facility to remove the CO2. Is it a free move to instead of doing it at the LNG facility, do it right at the edge of the sedimentary basin? Um, all the pipelines more or less come to a common point. So I think the opportunity is the same regardless of what, what pipeline or pipeline options you're looking at. Do it there. Even in a scenario where you say, look, we're 0.25% CO2, it doesn't make sense to sequester it. But if we do it there, instead of doing it at the LNG plant, if the gas composition gets higher in CO2 to a point where you say, now we actually do have to sequester, we've actually sort of future-proofed. What is that? Hashtag future-proof? <laughs> Hashtag future-proofed the value chain to be able to say we, we've preserved the opportunity. Um, and uh, as we heard, I think in December, uh, this blue line, that is our T-South pipeline, but the main BC hydro corridor happens to be there. So the facility could be electrified relatively easily. So that's, that's, that is, uh, I think, uh, in a nutshell, kind of the concept. And we wanted to bring that and put that uh, sort of to the working team along with all of the other things we're thinking about as an opportunity to maybe uh, build some resiliency into the, into the supply chain as it's developed. I think the opportunity exists for, for all of the systems that are out there, including CGL that's being, being built today. I mean, LNG Canada, I think, already has the ability on the first phase to remove CO2 at the plant, but if you start to build the supply chain this way, um, you enable, I think, a capture and sequestration opportunity. What that would mean for the pipelines is we would then say, okay, now we're um, actually going to demand a lower gas, a lower CO2 gas quality from that point on on the pipe. We'll go to 50 ppm. A couple other things, just sort of, there's, there's all kinds of little efficiencies here. If I'm transporting 2% CO2 in my gas, that means 2% of the energy is used to move something that I'm just going to vent and that's going to cost me later. So if I take it out upstream, even if I still vent it, it's a 2% savings in fuel gas. You almost directly correlated. So just in summary, um, I, mean, I think I, I've hit the key points. We're not saying this is, this is the right choice in this case. This isn't the biggest chunk of CO2 out there, but it is a meaningful chunk, especially if we go to scale. If we start talking about six to eight BCF a day, this starts to come, you know, and we get into higher CO2 content gas, we start talking about, you know, two to three to four or five megatons per year. Um, which is, you know, getting to be 5% of the existing energy mix. So, you know, we, we'd put that back to the facility developers to say, you know, let's look at this together and see if there's an opportunity to um, enhance the supply chain. The other thing is you've now done all of your CO2 recovery at one point, which means aggregating to scale to do sequestration, that hurdle becomes lower. And some of the really innovative things we heard about yesterday about other things you can do besides sequester CO2, you now have a single point source that's of scale that it's actually worth one of these um, clean tech companies to come in and say, actually, I now have enough CO2 in one spot to actually pursue one of these opportunities. So that is, in a nutshell, kind of what we're thinking. I'm going to give, I got, I got about five minutes if there's any questions. What would one of these facilities look like? And do we have any ex existing examples that are out there? <coughs> do they have a big footprint? So, so the facility is, is um, fundamentally, it's an aiming plant. We actually build these all the time um, in the upstream side. Um, the cabin gas plant north of Fort Nelson was essentially an aiming plant. 
So, so they're they're fairly they're they're fairly familiar in that sense, but the footprint's large. Um, but it, but again, if the footprint is the same as it would have been on the LNG facility, it's just whether you do it here or there. Well, if I understand it, this is just a very small fraction of billion, and so a tanker bank. What you do with the billion becomes a problem in the LNG because you want it all back in the place you start out. Right, so uh, there's natural gas liquids of which there is a very small amount of C5 plus, yes. Um, and we have actually looked at that. So there, this, is a, uh, this is a sort of active conversation with um, the LNG developers. In some cases, they, they want a very specific gas quality in terms of the NGLs that are trained. And it, there's a question about where the most efficient place to do it is. Um, because what is probably expensive is to remove the C5 plus here and then have to deal with propane and butane somewhere else, you'd want to do it all in one spot. So that would be that would be the question. But in principle, yes, you could absolutely do it here. You could also do all of the dehydration that you wanted. So if you want to go to 10 ppm on water, uh, which is what you need, again, for the exact same reasons you need 50 ppm on CO2, you can choose to do that here as well. And that, I think, would have both, moving both CO2 and water would have positive um, effects for us in terms of pipeline integrity and things like that.